That Great Business Show, Ireland's best business podcast. ThatGreatBusinessShow.com is brought to you by De Facto Shaving Oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to episode 109 of That Great Business Show. Ireland's Best Business Podcast, posting on the 14th of October, 2022. For I am Conal O'Moran. Today, as we record, it's National Women's Enterprise Day, organised by our pals at the local enterprise offices, so a great excuse to have some great women entrepreneurs join us. And before I introduce you to them, let me make my usual request to share. Share. Share this uh, podcast. Give the gift of inspiration by sharing the stories from our great guests. So don't just like us, share us. Also, I was so busy with the cast of thousands on the Intertrade Ireland story on the show last week, that's episode 108, that I forgot to tell you that our own business is growing. One podcast is a horse, but we now have a second podcast. That means we have a stable My friends Peter Leonard and Mark Tottenham, the award-winning team behind Law on Trial, have launched their brand new podcast called The Fifth Court, essential listening for anyone in and around the law. Episode one had Judge Jerry Hogan on, and aptly this week their VIP guest is Karen Harty, formerly a big wig in McCann's Fitzgeralds, but who has very recently joined the vast legal firm that is Denton's. They have 12 thousand lawyers employed worldwide. Check out the Fifth Court. All our great tips and insights you hear on That Great Business Show are brought to you, as always, thanks to De Facto Shaving Oil, made in Mayo, sold worldwide. Now, when it comes to a gift from a child to a parent, it has to be affordable. What better for a dad, granddad, uncle, brother, or anyone really, than to have a great value bottle of De Facto Shaving Oil Pop on to DeFactoShave.com, buy it, and Karina will make sure it's in your letterbox. It's designed to fit just a day or two later. It's ideal for gifting, if you get my drift. De facto shaving oil, smooth as... And so, to episode 109. Shortly, we'll have two women with very different businesses talking about their enterprise journeys. But to start with, I think it's fair to say that everybody listening knows the Red Cow Morans Hotel. Tracy Moran is one of the Moran family. Her job is not just keeping the 300-bedroom Red Cow landmark front and centre of our minds, but she also has a second hotel she's promoting. That's the Rain Urban Nest Hotel in the very, very, very centre of Dublin. And still that's not enough for her. She also has got another business aimed at teenage and their mental health. Tracy Moran, welcome to that great business show. (laughs) Thank you. And what a pleasure to be here. But you make it sound like I'm doing this all on my own some. And uh, alas, it is not that uh, it is not that way. And we have a huge team around us. You keep busy. I'm a very busy person. As they say, ask a busy person and uh, she'll get it done. Um, Yeah, I've loved... I love the way that you're stuck in that she'll get it done. She'll get it done. Yeah, I do advocate uh, the female um, involvement and our ability to multitask, as they say. Uh, and get things uh, get things going. But no, we have an amazing team. Uh, I have an amazing family around me as well. So the Red Cow is very much a family business. Um, I run it with my sister, Karen, my brother, Tommy, and my brother, Michael, and a whole host of amazing people. Um, we are actually the operators, the appointed operators for Ren Urban Nest. Uh, we aren't actually the owners. Um, so we were appointed the operators when it opened uh, just over a year ago. So we're celebrating the first anniversary actually this month. It's a um, nice little operators. hotel. Now, little, it's like it's fine, but it's little for another reason. Explain. Um, it's small but smart. Um, so it has been put together uh, with a very considered uh, set of criteria. Um, it is Ireland's first net zero carbon hotel. Um, it is probably the most sustainable hotel and hotel building in the country. Um, and it's got bags of personality given its size. So it sits on the former Andrews Lane Theatre. It literally takes the full circumference of um, the original building. Um, it's 137 bedrooms or nests, as we like to call them. So we have snug and cosy nests. Um, and they are small but cleverly put together with a lot of um, attention to detail and cleverly decided in terms of um, the fit out and the facilities that have been put 
put in them. It looks gorgeous. It's well worth going onto the website because there is, as you say, it's clever design. And yeah. it is centre city and it's meant to be, I presume, affordable. It is affordable. Um, I think the, the craziness that is in Ireland at the moment, to be fair, has thrown rates a little bit out the window. Um, but I suppose ultimately what we always want as business owners and as hotel operators is that value is, is perceived and that you don't feel like you're compromising on your stay uh, for the price that you've paid, that you have had a stay that's that's different, that's luxurious. Um, by being, you know, I suppose sustainable and eco-friendly and all of that good stuff, um, you don't you're, you're not compromising on anything from a luxury point of view. So it's all about perceived value and you know what that stay means to you. And one of the many reasons that you are here, because naturally we wanted to find out all about the family behind Moran's Hotel, is that Nicola Kearns of Nikki's Tea or Nick's mm. Tea, I think she calls it, mentioned that we should really have you on. There is symbiosis, there's a nice word, between the two, because you stock her tea and she promotes you. That's the way good business works. Well, it is. It is. And that's how sustainable business culture works. And, you know, we'll we'll get into the whole topic of what sustainability means to me there in a second. But Nick is an amazing lady and she's one of a number of ladies who I would say have really inspired my education piece when it comes to sustainability. So... Um, aside from Nick supplying the hotel, I got to know Nick, or Nikki, I should say, when we did um, an event for International Women's Day last March. So we wanted to do something that would encourage people, uh, women in the locality to come and see the property. Um, and we, our focus was on women in business who promote, um, who uh, their passion is the planet and um, they promote themselves as being passionate about the environment. Um, and Nikki was one of them. And we had a number of other ladies, um, Roxanne Parker, Sharon um, Farron from Kokoro Zenware, Pat from Ryuzi, uh, Joe Linehan, uh, the Futurist. We had some amazing, amazing ladies. Um, and they really inspired me because they, they, they shared their stories, their business stories, and they taught me so much more about sustainability. Um, you know, I suppose... The, the proof is in the pudding. I sat down beside my son the other day and I said, you know, what does sustainability mean to, to you? And I asked the office the same question today. And there's a, a bit like myself, I would say, pre-Ren, I would have said it's about not using too much plastics. It's about, you know, saving the planet and your footprint. But, you know, I think that's quite daunting because there's a feeling that um, I've, how can I save the planet and how can I do all of these things? So it becomes this far reaching proposition. Um, but what the, these ladies, um, Nikki included, have, have really shown me and told me that sustainability is more, it's a mindset, you know, it's a set of values. It's, it's a way of doing business. It's a way of conducting your life. Um, it's a considered approach to the decisions that you make, the choices that you make, um, how you choose to do business. So in, I suppose, in having these collaborations, in meeting people like Nikki, like Pat, like Joe, like all of the ladies I just mentioned, um, you know, there there is there's a collaborative approach to making an impact. You know, um, Ireland can help each other. You know, Ireland and Irish businesses can can help by having that kind of a culture where there is very much a support local, where there's you know preference and priority given to supporting your local suppliers. Ireland is a very small country, um, but it has huge talent, huge ability, um, amazing products. Um, and, you know, the internet, we can love it and hate it all in one go. But what it has done is it's helped us to, you know, to present and to platform products and businesses that we other, might otherwise have not known about. Small businesses like uh, Nick's Tea, um, where we can, once we're aware of them, if we can and when we can, we'll incorporate them into our businesses. Oh, boy. That means that you're going to get a whole heap of businesses knocking on your door now Great. to see whether they can come to you. Great. But what I would say is that, and I'm, I suppose, personally and also from a business point of view, it is very much about the business, the little steps. And when you consider a decision, some things you can do and some things you can't. And ultimately, you know, you'll look at things from all sorts of angles and some things make sense at the time and some things don't. So I'd love to hear from them because, it, you know, it sets a seed. And where I can't use something maybe in direct business, there's other aspects of my life, business and interests where maybe there's, there's other collaborations to be met. Do you use the whole sustainability thinking around Moran's Hotel as well as the, the REN or is it, do you keep them separate? Absolutely. And, you know, labels are great um, because they help us to box something, but they can also be, 
counterintuitive or counterindicative because they don't help you to really understand what what the ethos or the essence is. There's an awful lot of what we've been doing um, as business people in the Red Cam Warren Hotel for years that now comes under the sustainable or sustainability heading. Such as? Such as, I would say, you know, a value culture, you know, recognising the value and like that, considered choices when it comes to selecting suppliers, remaining supportive of local um, produce and local people in terms of whether it's fit outs or interiors or products. Sometimes that's not possible. But as I say, when you're, you're considering a project or a piece of work or how you operate, priority as part of our values would come into that, that um, practice. But also you're in business, so price comes into it as well. It does. And it therefore does. there's a trade-off and you say, yeah. yeah, I'd love to have the local supplier, but yeah. Johnny down somewhere else has it at a quarter of the price. But there's a balance. So it's never going to be just one part of it. It's quality, service and price. So, you know, Price is one thing and sometimes people do fall at that hurdle because you'll pick price over the other elements. But it is about service and it is about the quality of that product and ultimately that will that will win out. But we'll always couple those three and bring it in under the kind of the preference for local and for Irish. And as I did explain to you, and with good reason, to that there is no structure to these chats. I never give any Here advance work. <laughs> no, no, I'm just interested as maybe some ideas of things that you have done in any of your businesses, th- three at the moment, but maybe there are others that people just, you say, why don't people do X or why don't they do more of Y? Anything like that that you just say, God, it's so simple. Why don't they just do that? You know, it's 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 everything, though. It's a culture in terms of even locally supporting your community in terms of the charities that you support, um, the, you know, recognising the value of kind of local, whether it's sports, schools, um, you know, activities like that. Um, and it's not just from a from a business, from a commercial. It can be from, you know, from a heartfelt wanting to get you, because when you have a, a business and your participants, your staff all work for you, it's it's a family, you know, and their family live in the community. So by helping them, you're helping others and so on and so forth. So I would say certainly in terms of our support of not just those that operate directly within the business, but also giving back. And we've done that over the years, publicly, privately, in all different shapes and forms. Um, it's about, you know, supporting community in whatever that, um, that guise comes under. Now I'm going to go into the, some of the standard questions that you're always asked, I'm sure, about the tourism industry in Ireland. Mm. Too expensive, can't get staff, inflation going through the roof, all of the above. We are, are we, question, pricing ourselves out of the tourism market rather rapidly. You know what? It's a, it's a scary situation at the moment. Um, you know, I understand how and why that's happening because there's less accommodation available within the market because of um, the government's usage of hotels to look after um, our refugees. Um, so, you know, it is making it difficult because the, the, the less availability of hotels, um, the higher the price is going to be. And, you know, as a hotelier, I am obviously concerned about that because I do see... It's not just about now, it's the sustainability of it and it's the future-proofing of our events, conferences, conventions um, that come in sort of three-year cycles. And I would be concerned that in the next year or two that um, there would be some of those bodies will look at Ireland and will look at other European countries and say, you know what, we can't go there because of the the cost of doing it. So, yeah, I would have, as a, I suppose as a hotelier, I would have concerns. Um, there is an element, though, of... You know, looking at the negatives and talking ourselves into all, you know, there's, there's obviously the practical, there's inflation, there's all of this real stuff happening. But at the same time, we're talking ourselves into a recession. Um, and there's an element of that that Ireland has to be a little bit more cautious of. And the amount of people that have said that to me of late um, is incredible that, you know, we need to look at all of the positives, look at where we're at in terms of our economy, look at all the, the, the benefits of Ireland as a place to do business and focus on driving that and, and focus on not falling into recession and see how that how that pans out for us. If Tracy Moran had a magic wand, what would she wand, first of all, or what couple of things might you wave your magic wand at to fix? Oh, gosh, you see, there's the, there's the Tracy Moran in business and there's the Tracy Moran um, personal. Um, and well, I'm thinking more business. We are a business podcast. Yeah, we'll do the other yeah. stuff later. Um, the, for example, staff, it must be just 
impossible. I see it on every window of every service business wanted people, anything. If you can walk, come in. It's it's so frustrating. You know, you hear some of the announcements in terms of unemployment and unemployment is down, but we can't get the staff and we can't get chefs, we can't get service staff. And it's in every walk of life. The amount of businesses I've seen, small independents, closed shops with um, limited hours, you know, closing for lunch where they never did before. So what do you do? That's not a business. If you're, if you're meant well, to be serving food and you can't serve food, what do you do? I mean, I'd love to see a little bit more joined up thinking in terms of even, you know, we have all of these amazing people coming into the country that we're, we're looking to look after. We need to facilitate them better in terms of um, allowing them to be able to work um, you know, you look at Killarney, for example, you had 130 people that had started in, a, in the community, had started working, had started in employment, being pulled out and moved to another county. Fortunately, they've been reversed again. It has but been I reversed, utterly, which I think is utterly amazing. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. I guess. So where we have solutions, let's yeah. maximise on it, you know, and... At the end of the day, like I remember years and years ago, um, way back uh, when there was a, I'm trying to think even when it was, it's, it's a long time ago. Um, and I remember there was an initiative where hotels did go across to parts of Asia and to Malaysia. And there was a drive on on labour to bring people over. And at the time we employed quite a lot and we still have some of those amazing people working with us. And I, I don't well, think that should be... Why that's not being done now? I, well, I don't know, but I don't think it should be necessary. Not if, you know, we have a, a huge number of people still in the country either not working or maybe there's reasons that they're not being put in a position that they can work. So whether it's the Ukrainians that don't have childcare for the kids or whether they haven't got the paperwork through, who knows? I think all of that could be looked at and maybe that's a solution in in some small um, part. But it's the cost of living, it's the um, the accommodation you know, that's that's a whole big part. Um, the Brazilian um, student workforce used to come over and they used to be a lot of our service staff. Um, they used to be a lot of our childminders as well. I struggled to get childminding during the summer. But they can't get accommodation. So, you know, it filters back, don't come, there's no accommodation. So it's all of that. It's it's accommodation um, and it's making sure that all the, the, the dots are being, or all the T's are being crossed and the I's dotted to make sure that they can actually process and that they can work. Working in a family business, the joys, the joys. Do you ever have really good rows? Loads of them. <laughs> <laughs> we love it warts and all. Tell us about some great fights you've had. Let me just divert for a second. There is a family, they were very, very well-known property developers years and years ago. And I learned about this, true story, is at board meetings, they actually used to get down on the floor and beat the lard out of each other. True Jeez. story. Now, you haven't done that yet, no? No, we haven't. Well, I'd like to say never, and that won't, <laughs> that won't transpire. Um, you know, I suppose as a family, we're very conscious of it never becoming an issue. And, you know, we're we're very transparent with each other. We do discuss because we... But I think the big difference between us is that we work hard together, but we also play hard together. So we're a very close family. We live very close to each other. We actually socialise uh, together, which might sound a little bit um, bizarre given our proximity in terms of work. Um, but we're very different personalities. We all have different skill sets. Um, we don't live in each other's pockets in the business. So we, we, we work in our, in our own channels as such. Um, but we come together and, and I think it's the diversity of our thoughts, of, our, of the way we think and the way we, you know, yes, we debate. Yes, we disagree. But if we were all the same then you wouldn't come up with some of the wacky ideas or be able to pivot or, or maintain, um, I suppose, our business acumen as we have done. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRentCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRentCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Viscosity. When you shave, you want the highest viscosity because it helps the blade run smoother. De facto, the world's best shaving oil has incredible viscosity. That's why De facto leaves your face, underarms, or legs nick free. Higher viscosity makes blades last longer. De facto is the best for your skin and your pocket. DeFactoShave.com. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back then. Where did all the business acumen that you mentioned come from? Your dad? 
I would say my amazing dad. Yeah. So do you want to talk about him because he had a, a serious fall mm. oh, a few years ago, and he hasn't been well. Yeah. So in 2016, my dad was uh, attending a wedding in Spain. A really good friend of his, Charlie Chalk's daughter, was getting married. Um, and dad, um, you know, we'd had a couple of years before where dad had been, you know, exceptionally busy with the changing dy- dynamic of our of our business group. Um, so he had gone to this wedding, really looking forward to it, um, excited about the couple of days break, I suppose. Um, and on his way home after one of the day's events, uh, dad took a fall and it transpired he'd, he'd actually had a stroke. So he had a significant bleed to the brain, um, brain injury caused by the fall on top of that, rushed into uh, emergency care in Spain, uh, was six weeks in a coma. That's a long time. It was a long time. And, you know, truth be told, he was never meant to leave Spain alive. They really didn't think he would actually survive. Uh, the odds were seriously stacked against him. But, you know, he's a tough vicar. <laughs> he's, a, he's a limerick man. He's stubborn. And at no stage has he ever given up. Um, and... You know, he he did the the six weeks in a coma and then he was airlifted back to Dublin. And honestly, I can remember the day like it was yesterday. He was airlifted back in. My brother Stephen and I and my brother-in-law Thor were there to meet um, his neurologist or the the appointed neurologist for him coming into St. James Hospital, Colin Doherty. And Colin has heard me tell this story so many times. So Colin, um, in his uh, professionalism, gave us the, I suppose, the the bleak outlook, you know, at that stage, dad had started to come around. Remarkably, he was actually starting to come out of the coma when he when he hit home soil. Um, but Colin showed us where the bleeds had happened, the damage to the brain, where they were. And he painted a very bleak outlook. Um, and he spoke about whether or not we wanted to resuscitate. Um, and, you know, it was just like we'd just been, it was a whirlwind. It was like somebody had just given us a slap. Um, Stephen and I stood there holding hands, the tears just pouring down our faces. And I remember my brother, uh, my brother-in-law, Thor, who's so positive, he's an incredible ambassador for positivity. Um, And he said, but he's made it this far and he wasn't meant to survive Spain. And it was, uh, and I remember responding to him saying, geez, Thor, I said, I don't hear anything positive coming out of Colin's mouth, you know, because, you know, positivity wasn't the, the subject of the moment. Um, but lo and behold, he actually, um, he continued to progress. He continued to improve. Um, like, you know, we got a, a further diagnosis at one stage. They said he wouldn't walk, he wouldn't talk, he wouldn't eat. He defied all of that. Um, so while he is mo- mobility impaired, he can walk with the with the support of an aide. He can talk, he can socialise. He has been at all the Limerick Games. Um, he's an absolute ambassador for life. Um, and he'll defy anyone who tells him he's not going to get fully better. And he is also, I think you told me, involved in the business. He comes in and gives us tuppence worth as well. He comes in and he will, yeah, he'll throw his pounds worth in. He'll challenge, he'll question, uh, still sits at our board meetings. Um, it's, he's an incredibly astute mind, you know, um, and he'll just throw out the humdingers every so often. It'll either redirect or it'll make you question, you know, decisions that we're, we're focusing on. Board brings me neatly along to the future because uh, you always have to wonder, are you ever happy with one, then two, with a third hotel or maybe a fourth hotel or would that be on the horizon or what you're thinking of that? So uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we went from one hotel to four more in hotels and then up to 10 hotels when we bought the six Bewley's. And then we came back down to one hotel. And I we remember the story very that. well. So I suppose as a family, we've proven that we're not a family to sit still. We're always looking for opportunities. We're always on the other That's a yes. That's an absolutely yes. But again, it's like the sustainability question. It's a considered approach. We'll look at everything and it has to be the right fit in all shapes and forms. What would the perfect fit be for you? Oh gosh, there's there's the, the absolute like they're so dream. different. Like a red cow is so different to the wren, in my head anyway. Mm, they, it it is. I mean, we'd love a city centre hotel, you know. But what's available? Uh, well, that's for another discussion. <laughs> Talking to people, we're, we're always looking. We're always looking. You know, there's an element of always wanting to build and build what, exactly what you want to create your own concept. Um, you know, we is that better because, of course, when you take over an existing, whether it's a hundred year old building, we've done both. Yeah, yeah, we've done both. So we have done, we've done the the build from scratch, the Red Cow Hotel. We've done Chiswick, uh, the Crown Moran that we had in London, 
And then we've done where you take over. And I suppose what we have learned, even in, in when we had Silver Springs back in the day, um, renaming doesn't work because, you know, it, it's forever known as that particular property. Um, and it is harder to put your stamp on it. Um, not impossible, but it is harder. So, you know... <laughs> In an ideal world, if you said to me, you know, you had X amount and you could go out and you could spend on the perfect, it would be to build our own in the city centre. But, you know, who, who knows? We'll keep, we'll keep looking. There are many people who don't want any more hotels built in the city centre. Obviously, you're not mm-hmm. one of them. Um, I'm not one of them. But again, I suppose, and I, I am, um, you know, I do take that question quite, um, quite seriously because that was one of the factors when Alt you know, was being converted. Andrews Lane Theatre was being converted into a hotel. And Is that I think what you call it? Alt? Alt was... Um, <laughs> that Alt was built by uh, yeah. one of my former stockbroking uh, wow. partners, a fellow called Huey O'Donnell. I know right, yeah. Andrews Lane extremely well. Poor old Huey is no longer with us, but uh, yeah. yeah. But I think, again, I was. I suppose it's it's how you then do business thereafter. So... I I do believe that Ren Urban Nest um, is very uh, it's a conscious um, business, both eco friendly wise and also culturally and in terms of its community. So it is about working with a community. You can't land a big hotel in the middle of somewhere um, and not work with the residents and the community around you. Make it a property that actually gives back as well as contributes. And I think that uh, Ren Urbaness does that. We are going to run out of time, so we better get on to what you would love to talk about a bit more, the other business, the other which business. is the kids' business. It's mm. a lovely idea. You know, I'm very proud of it. It was a concept I came up with um, this time last year. Um, and in six months, I made the concept a reality, which was quite daunting. Um, it's called Inside Out Camps. Um, I have a personal passion and interest in um, teen confidence and teen mental health. So looking at the confidence bit first, I, I really do believe, and I'm an ambassador for self-esteem, and I, I believe that if our, if our kids, if our teens have more confidence in their own ability, in their own physical, mental well-being, in their own value, in what they have to offer and give back, um, I believe that will help to reduce the mental health issues that they will have going forward from there. So it's a proactive approach to mental health. We're not bringing... It's, so I suppose the, the, the idea behind it is we run a, a residential summer camp. Um, we bring teens or I should say from 12 to 15. So the idea is that kids from um, finishing sixth class before they head into big school and then first and second years. Because I... Talking to the likes of Joan Freeman and talking to ambassadors for teen mental health and psychologists and teachers, um, it's been recognised that it's a, it's a really pivotal time in a teen's development, that period between 12 and 15, um, where the hormones are raging, where there's a lot of life questions coming in, where they're really starting to challenge who and what they are, where they're going, their value, what they're, you know, what they're about and, you know, where they're going to go. So um, I suppose, and, and, you know, my own upbringing, I would say the same. We, we moved from Limerick to Dublin and there was a lot of changes and that affected my, my own mental health at the time, which is, is something I'll come back to there in a second. So I came up with this idea of a summer camp where the teens get to get away from their normal routine. So it's taking them out of their normal life, their normal circle. Um, it's detox, uh, it's digital detox. Uh, which is a whole different conversation and, and uh, topic. Um, it's the idea, it's very much nature focused, but it's fun activity and learning through nature. And there's lessons and there's role models and there's a positive spin on really getting to know who and what you are. So it's discovering skills, discovering things that you didn't know about yourself, what you can do, what you are about, what value you have to give. And all done in a very fun, non-academic way. I'm very much about not sitting in a classroom. You could be out, um, you know, in in the forestry, doing a hike, um, foraging. You could be playing a, ga- a game of basketball. It's a complete mishmash. It's physical, it's mental. Because I do think that not everybody is academic, not everybody is physical, but we can all benefit from giving both our medical, our, our mental and our physical well-being a little bit of a challenge every so often and give, giving it a bit of a run for its money. And you're going to come back to your own personal interest in this area? Yeah, so um, as I said, we, we moved from uh, Limerick to Dublin in 1988. So I was, uh, it at during that pivotal time, I was uh, 13 going on 14, changed schools halfway through a year um, and I developed depression from the age of 14, 15. Um, and it's something I've battled all my life. 
Um, I battle it now very proactively. Um, I really do see the value and benefit in exercise, in minding your 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 inner state. You know, ultimately, if if your mind and your inner state are not functioning, are not performing, then nothing else will work. And you know, there's that's there's an element of that that I want to to teach my own kids and also the kids that come to the camp. Um, you know, there's a frustration in you know I'm. A very young woman. I'm not going to share on the airwaves what age I am, but I've, uh, I'm a mother of three. And there's a lot I would have liked to have known about myself younger. Um, there's a lot I would have liked to have recognised um, from a value, from a self-esteem point of view, younger. So really what Inside Out Camps is about is about kids learning about themselves earlier so they're better placed to deal with life's challenges. And you use the plural there, camps, but there's only one camp at the moment. Are you planning world domination? Sorry, it's it's by camps, I mean that it'll run over a series of weeks. Would you do more of them elsewhere? Because that one is Dublin-based. Um, well, this is only going to be the second year. I would absolutely love to grow it, um, but it's like the little steps that we do in Wren. Uh, we need to make sure that it's sustainable. I want to make it commercially viable um, so that it can actually wash its own face, continue to grow, and then from there out, then we'll make decisions in terms of how we grow it and how we use it to benefit all communities and all schools and all, all levels. And you know what is the final question that we ask you, because mm. I have warned you, but I'm going to ask you a second question. And I've already asked you, where did the name <laughs> the red cow come from? I have deliberated, debated and researched this at length. Um, I suppose there was a red cow pub that goes back to the 1800s. And a lot of the areas, because we have got the top of uh, topography maps, I can't, I don't know what they're exactly called. That's the correct word. It yeah. is. So we have those, we've got these big blow up maps in the Link Lounge in the Red Cow. And they do show all of these different areas from shoulder of mutton, as you quite rightly said earlier, to Bluebell, to Green Hills. And I, we can only at this um, stage um, surmise that it's down to either geographical or agricultural um, practices in the area that might have dictated. Maybe there was loads of cows in the area but they would have to be red though they would, they, they would have to be red now funnily enough when we were actually doing the extension and we were doing the, the dig we came across some bones when we were doing the dig and they happened to be pigs so that threw my whole theory and ethos about cows into so uh, it could be the disarray. red pig could be the red pig <laughs> Oh. So we don't have the answer, but we're always seeking it. And if anyone listening can give us more information, because I've, I've put it out on a number of platforms and forums, and I would love to know the ultimate answer. So the final, final question to Tracy Moran is, who would she hire in a heartbeat? Now, I've thought about this at length, and I'm not going to give you a direct, direct answer. I'm going to give you a slightly light, um, long-winded version, but That's it's my okay. version. So if I was to talk about it from my own personal, it's hypothetical. She no longer lives, unfortunately. Um, Maya Angelou um, is a, a personal inspiration um, because she, I suppose she epitomises everything that I believe in. I'm passionate about people and I'm passionate about people and kids and teens recognising their own individuality and their own amazingness. And that's what Maya Angelou was all about. So if you had Maya in your business, you could not... Um, have a better advocate for individuality and amazingness. And teach me who was Maya Angelou or where was she? Or she, So she was a speaker, an actress, an advocate uh, for civil rights. Uh, she passed away in 2014 at age 86. This is in the US, isn't it? It was in the US, yeah. Um, you've heard, I'm sure you've heard quotes like, um, you may not remember what somebody said to you or did to you, but you'll always remember how they made you feel. And that is something I've always stood by. So she has some amazing uh, quotes that really, I suppose, really shape, you know, what you believe in from a value perspective. So the other one is a little um, left of field. And this is with Inside Out in, in mind. Um, and I came up with the idea of Lady Gaga, right? So it, it, it is a bit random. But Lady Gaga, um, amazing performer in her own right, individualist, not afraid to stand out, um, very strong work ethic, was actually a camp counsellor back in the day as oh, a kid. So yeah. if I was to hire her in the morning for Inside Out, not only would she understand personally um, the whole camp ethos that I'm trying to get across, but she would be an icon and an ambassador for, you know, working hard for what you're passionate about 
And, you know, I suppose proving that the more you put in, the more you'll get out and that you can make it if, you, if you're passionate. And also be an individual, which was something I was going to come to you about very briefly. And that was um, my photograph, uh, John Murray. Um, John Murray is a photographer uh, based in the city. Hang on a second. Now, this is a photograph that you sent me of you. Yes. Because I asked for it for because, promotion. Because yep. you asked for it. But John Murray is one of my collaborators on Inside Out. And John, uh, John is an amazing advocate for you and you as an individual, as an individual brand. So he really advocates and endorses the importance of staying true to your individuality, which is what Maya was all about, which is what Lady Gaga was all about. And that's a theme that runs all the way through the camp. So John does a workshop in the camp where he's getting, um, and they're telling me to stop talking here now, but um, he does a part in the workshop. No, I'm not telling you because <laughs> I love this. Um, where he's he's very much, I mean, we look at our teens and they're they're, clones. They dress the same, they look the same, they want to speak ah, but the they same. Think they're different. And they think they're different. So he's trying to prove that when you take a photograph of yourself, it's really highlighting that you are the most unique brand that exists. You are individual. I like that. Which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah so well, it makes an awful lot of sense to me because there is only one of you. You're your best brand. Yeah. You know, but it's recognising that. And I think, you know, all of us could do with recognising it a little bit more. That is excellent. Lovely. Do come in to us again when you are have taken over some other hotels. Oh, the other one that I better get out of you is shout out now. I think 8th of March is coming up again, isn't it? Yes. You've got the most lovely cow with the lipstick on your website promoting your um, Women's Day. Am I right? The International Women's Day. Is that on again this coming so we, we next actually, March? We ran it in Wren Urban Nest. So um, we are looking at a series of different events. One of them will be for International Women's Day, hopefully working again with Roxanne Parker, with Sharon Farron and all the ladies. Um, the spin this time will be on sustainable styling. So again, a focus on trying to, you know, reuse, repurpose rather than using fast fashion. So again, there's there's lessons in that for the ladies and possibly the men. Lovely photograph of a cow looking into the camera with lipstick. I loved it. <laughs> Tracy Moran, thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. A pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thinking of travel? If so, make sure to make de facto the world's best shaving oil your choice of travel companion. A 25 milliliter bottle of de facto means no hassle at airports, no bulky cans to carry, and the guarantee of the world's best shave. DeFactoShave.com. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. That great business show. Variety is the spice of business, as that old phrase goes. With that in mind, we bring you two completely different businesses. One that makes throat lozenge type things for kids. The other is a twist on property development. So... How different is that? Sinead Crowther is founder of Tonstix, a pharmaceutical technician. Sinead saw a gap in the market with her throat lozenge on a stick idea. And they are now stocked in almost 800 pharmacies nationwide and sucked by thousands more. Joining her in studio is Lisa Gagan, founder of Sun Life, a company that creates something called Community Experiences in Property Development. Lisa's company creates happy tenants. Happy tenants stay longer and are happier. So a win for landlord and tenant. Both of these women have been helped by their local enterprise offices or Leo. And the Leos are Team GPS approved. So Lisa, August Sinead, welcome to That Great Business Show. Hi, thanks for having us. <laughs> Today is National Women's Enterprise Day and both of you have come from two different Leo events. Encourage, please, both of you, women, to get involved in industry and business and entrepreneurship and also to get involved in their Leos. We'll start with you, Sinead, because you look like you're mad keen to start talking. I, I get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> when did you or how did you get involved in the business? Because you were, as I said, a pharmaceutical technician and then you decided to go off and make your tongue sticks. I did. I That's did. a bit of a jump. 
yeah, it was a little bit of a leap, a five year leap, wasn't an overnight thing. Is that how long it took from A to Z, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so I um, was a pharmaceutical technician, started at age of 15 in transition year. That's how I got into pharmacy. And I just really loved that, um, building relationships across the counter and helping. Um, and even back then in the mid-90s, uh, a long time ago. No, no, what we say now is, is a while ago. A while ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was nothing specifically for children that was like the equivalent of like a hall soother. Just, you know, something that soothes the throat. Um, and I didn't pay too much attention to it. So fast forward 25 or uh, few years, <laughs> years. Um, and there was still nothing on the shelf. And I had worked in various pharmacies. And at this stage, I found myself separated with four children who had suffered tonsillitis and every kind of sore throat you can imagine. And I used to joke with my colleagues in pharmacy and say, you know what, I have a great idea. This is going to be my dragon's den. One day I'm going to do this. And I suppose the turning point came. This is a little bit, you know, dramatic. Um, I, my son had an accident while I was at work. He was only two. And he sustained horrific burns. Oh and I didn't know that that was my last day in the pharmacy. And while we were in hospital, we were in hospital for nearly a month. He developed sepsis and he nearly didn't survive that. And um, it was coming up to Christmas. It was a very stressful time. And my other three children were at home and I was thinking, you know, please hang on with us and I will make some sort of change in our lives and we will never be in this position again. And he got out of hospital on Christmas Eve and Santa came and it was the best, best thing ever. And I finished work. I didn't go back. I was terrified to leave them in case anything happened to any of them. Tough time. Like, you know, mentally it was a big toll, big burden, felt the guilt. And uh, New Year's Day 2017, I woke up and I had the laptop out wondering how I was going to pay the bills because I'd left the job. And is that the same uh, Christmas time that your son came back? So he was 2016, Christmas 2016. He had okay, the so this is, a year this is later. January 2017, oh, sorry, day so, one. So, so this yeah. is only a couple of, two weeks afterwards, yeah? Yeah, yeah, well, a bit, yeah. So, and I Googled. Week, week, no, so it was, he, he had his accent at the end of November. <laughs> sorry, sorry, the details, sorry. <laughs> it's very technical. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> sorry, I'm ruining a great story, sorry. <laughs> anyway, so I, I was wondering how I was going to pay the mortgage because I was on my own already and no job now. And I Googled, so worrying about the bills. And then I was like, do you know what? In the hospital, it was a struggle for doctors and nurses to administer medications. They're horrible. You have to pin the child down. Same with the throat thing. There was nothing specific. Glycerin syrups don't stay in contact with the throat long enough. And I thought, you know, this is a really good idea. My idea of essentially a jelly lozenge on it. It's delivered in a lollipop form for children. And I Googled that morning, like five o'clock in the morning. I wasn't sleeping. How do you make a product from scratch? And it brought me to a form. <laughs> And the form was Enterprise Ireland. And I was like, well, I don't know what this is, but it said, do you have an idea or a concept you'd like to explore? And I was like, I actually, I do. I do, yeah. Filled in the form and hit send and totally forgot about it. And then about a week later, when everyone came back after Christmas and the new year, I got a call from Enterprise Ireland, New Frontiers programme in Dundalk to say, we're really interested in this. This is a really good idea. Do you want to talk to us? And I was like, really? Because I felt... I suppose such a failure because I, my marriage broke down I was struggling with bills and my son had an accident and I was like someone said I, I'm doing something right or this you know and that so that lovely. was that was the turning point um, so I'll speed up long story short got on New Frontiers the concept did have legs they taught me everything about starting a business and signposting everything and then the programme ended and I was like what the mm. hell do I do now <laughs> went to the Leo for a primer grant okay. okay so I had it drawn on a piece of paper I just kept the piece of paper scribbly drawn and I had I had paid someone for a bit of brand and a bit of you know branded I, I, I you know identity and I went into the Leo with my idea and I said I've been talking to all these pharmacy buyers this is my network I know the problem they said if field dreams if you build it they will come they'll buy it <laughs> so I was, I was like and so that's all now I have no money <laughs> I have four children I'm currently no job <laughs> would you give me a prime grant <laughs> And they put it to the, you know, the board and they gave it to me. So then I had, I had a bit more self-belief and then I went to the bank, same thing. You don't get a loan when you're a mortgage and a loan parent. And I said, now, if you gave me this 20 grand loan to build a prototype, the primer grant are going to refund that because you have to spend your primer grant and then the Leo refund it. And because that I had that endorsement from the Leo, the bank said, yeah, build the prototype. And then the following year, I won competitive star fund with Enterprise Ireland 50k investment. Happy days. Um, and in, in between Just all of that. When you won that 50k, yeah. was that life turning, life changing or what was the big, big, big one that changed everything for you? I suppose the initial primer grant, which is why it's so pivotal because I, I knew I had to build a prototype 
I needed something in my hand tangible because jelly on a stick doesn't sound very impressive, does it? <laughs> you know, I was in these programs and like yourself, they're like, they have this technology and it's app and it's multi-platform. I've no business background, didn't know the jargon. I always felt a bit lost. And I'm like, yeah, my name's Sinead. I'm going to put jelly on a stick. I felt like an idiot, you know? <laughs> and um, the primary grants kind of gave me some validation. I was like, well, as these people in business believe I'm, I'm, I can do this or this is, you know, valid. Maybe it is. And then... That gave me um, the confidence to go to the bank. That's what ultimately got me um, building the prototype, which took two years. <laughs> Did it really? It's very two complicated. Years. Wow. Yeah, because the formulation is very... Com- we, there's no additives, no E numbers, no nasties. It's literally, it's just honey mixed with jelly. And to get that to the, the consistency where it melts in the mouth was technically very difficult. And then you have to put that on a person-shaped stick. There's no machinery that can facilitate a person-shaped stick. Lollipop sticks are straight. So it was very complex. But then when I won competitive star, so the prime and grant led me to that. I got the prototype, won competitive star fund. And um, then I got a co-founder in because when I had established the prototype and won CSF, I said, right, I can't do this on my own. It's too big. And I have four kids. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had met my co-founder on the New Frontiers program. She had another business and I really admired her work ethic. She was like just a workhorse and she was running a business which I never did and I was like well she's skills that I don't have and so like how could she refuse this offer I said look I've no money competitive the star fund I already had borrowed some for the prototype in addition to the primary grant I've only a couple of grand left can't pay a salary don't know if this is going to work don't know how long it's going to take are you in <laughs> <laughs> unbelievably she said I am yeah because she really believed that there was a place for this and so then uh we continued. She joined in November 2019. Okay, we know we what all happened, know what next, happened yeah. then. So we were in lockdown and then we had to design a way to scale this production up. No manufacturer in the world would touch it because number one, there's no jelly lollipops anywhere. And number two, there's no jelly lollipops on a stick shaped person. So because of the innovation, innovation is great, but it's a double edged sword because on one hand, everyone loves it because it's new. And on the other hand, no one knows what to do with you. So we had to innovate and merge processes to manufacture this, which we did over our kitchen tables via Zoom with engineers. And then uh, we had no money. <laughs> Again. Denise has four children. <laughs> I have four children. These two men threw a puppy into the mix in lockdown as well to add to the chaos. So then we had to convince investors. We have a route to market. We have 10 pharmacy chains. We know how to make it. We've sourced the equipment. Could you give us half a million euros? <laughs> You didn't. We did. Half a million. Half a million. That, as I often say, is a chunk of change. Chunk of change. And surprisingly, due to the unique nature, and they all were identified through their due diligence, there isn't anything like this serving this particular need specifically for children. They said yes. And not only that, we oversubscribed the round and we've ended up raising 1.2 million. We built our manufacturing facility in Dundalk. And we have seven employees, so there's nine of us in total. That is a terrific story. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> and well, we, we'll get on to the future in a second because uh, I better I better go over to Lisa and see what uh, Lisa can you match that? Yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. Um, oh my god, that's absolutely incredible. Um, I literally didn't want, didn't want to interrupt the good story, but um, it is an incredible story. Oh. I'd never heard this story before. Okay. So that is fantastic. Very Lisa, good. no pressure. No pressure. Son of Life it's is okay. your business. <laughs> it is. And you came up with what is, I certainly had never heard of a business like it. So that is a good thing. It's not unlike Tonsticks. It's very niche. Um, and I'm the first person to do this in the property sector. So I suppose my background is in property. I'm a charter property surveyor and I've worked um, you know, with different companies over the years. And I literally love... What does a chartered property surveyor do? It sounds quite fancy. Um, but really, basically, it just, you know, proves that you're qualified to be able to sign off on different things. Such as? So, so like if I was, I used to work in valuation. So I used to value property investment funds okay. and different um, one-off properties. So when you're chartered, you're actually able to like sign off on it. Whereas when you're not chartered, you can do all the work and then the person who's chartered signs off on it to make sure that everything is correct. So it's just um, standards, basically. Um, so you had the bits of paper? Had the paper. Um, and I basically loved property until I just didn't love it anymore. Um, and I knew I needed to make a change. And I was working for a company called uh, Green Reese, Green Property at the time. And that was amazing. And 
after I finished on a project there, I was able to go off traveling. So I was very lucky to be able to go off traveling for 13 months and just get a bit of a break and a bit of perspective. And during that time, I really started to think about, well, what is it I actually want to do? And the big key thing that really came to me was making impact on people's lives. Like, how can I help people? How can I improve the way people are living? And I suppose I didn't really know what that was going to be. All I knew is that that's what I wanted to do. So I came home with no plan, uh, got offered a, a good few jobs back in the property sector, and I just didn't feel like it was the right move for me. I wasn't excited about anything. And if I'm not excited about a job, I can't take it. Uh, even though my parents were like, what are you doing? You're getting offered all these jobs. You haven't even handed in a CV anywhere. And you're sitting here going, no, it's not the right option. Um, so then I actually wrote out what I wanted to do. And I really started to think about the way that we all live our lives. And I used to work in an office the majority of a week of the week, I'd get in at nine o'clock, maybe earlier, work right through. I'd go out at lunchtime, grab a sandwich, come back, work through my lunch. Like we could finish work at whatever time, evening, nighttime, depending on deadlines, get home to my apartment building where I didn't know anybody, didn't know my neighbours. And it was like, repeat, this is five days a week. And I just thought, like, now, don't get me wrong, I had a nice network of friends, but I thought, what an unusual way to live, especially coming from like our Drahan in the country where everybody knows everybody. Like people are just knocking in on your house, in the door, um, very much community orientated. So I thought, is there not something that we could do in this space? And genuinely, I was chatting to one of my friends who is still working in that property company and he was recommending all these different jobs for me. And I said, no, that's not what I want to do. And he's like, well, what do you want to do? And I kind of explained what I was thinking and he said, well, you hardly want to take this job out in Central Park in Leopardstown. He's like, look, we, ha we have this idea around kind of trying to make a better experience for the people in this property development that we own. We, tr we had um, an event company trying to do it before. It didn't work. Look, maybe this is just an idea that's not going to get legs or do you want to give it a go and see what happens? I was like, oh my God, I love this. Like, this is exactly what I really want to get into. And like what I loved about the opportunity was it was like very open. So it's not like I basically had free reign to kind of create what I thought was the right way to go about it. I, I had no experience doing this, by the way, like my background's property. I'd never organized an event in my life. But I think when you're passionate enough about something, you, you will figure it out. And I loved every moment of it. And I brought in even my own values of like, you know, I wanted to integrate charity events and how could we actually make impact for the local community as well. So we did a lot of work with Laura Lynn and I started to figure out, well, what do companies have in common and how can we actually bring people who've got common interests together and all these different things. And I just loved how everything kind of grew legs. Um, and we went from having like zero engagement to having over four and a half thousand people engaged, signed up to the newsletter. And all of our events went from being, you know, start small, because I was like, I like to say something is sold out. Uh, so we'd start small um, and then we're up to like 300 people plus at our community gatherings on the bigger ones where we'd have the bigger budgets. And it was it literally took legs. So I, I really loved the concept. And then at the same time, I was, I became a qualified Reiki practitioner and a kinesiologist because in the spare time, I was thinking of setting up my own wellness spare company. Time. How did you have spare time? Oh, I was just very passionate. <laughs> I was, I, do you know when you come back from traveling, just like, oh my God, I want to try all these new things. So yeah, it was a lot. But at the same time, I was very passionate about these different things. So I came to a point where I was thinking of setting up a wellness company, but then I also really loved what I was doing. So I actually went off at Christmas time for a three week holiday to like, again, kind of reconnect. And this is into January 2019. And I just kind of decided, do you know what? I think you're onto something here. I think if this really works here, it's probably needed in other property developments. And I just had the idea. I was very excited about it. And I came home and I told um, the, my boss what I was thinking kind of half nervous, kind of half excited. And then he said, look, if this is something you want to do, we'll support you. And, we, you know, I'd never hold anybody back from, you know, spreading their wings is actually what he said. Um, so then I thought, OK, how are we going to figure this out? But I, it all just started to roll naturally then. I had the idea, kind of got permission to go off and build it myself. But still, I'd never run a business before, didn't have a business plan. And next thing, a landlord came and contacted me and asked me, but, oh, you know what you did there in Central Park in Leopardstown? Is there any way you could do that for us in your in, in our property development? I thought, oh my God. How did like, that landlord know that you existed? 
Because the program I had built had been going on for two years and it became very successful and it became placemaking is kind of back then 2017 to 2019 placemaking was something that was starting to become more topical in property. I was the first person to develop a community engagement program in Ireland and the only one that people could compare it to, could talk about was the one that I built. So there was no one else to really ask, I guess. Um, so they came to me going, do you see what you did in that property development? Can you do that for us and ours? And I thought, yeah. Um, and then I still, but it was still kind of conversations that were rolling. And then literally, I think a couple of weeks later, I got a call from another landlord asking me to do the same thing. So before I knew it, I had three clients even though I had no paperwork signed. Um, but I had three clients before I had a business plan. And then I thought, right, okay, well, now I have to go for this. You know what I mean? Um, and I ended up getting um, the first girl to join the company. Her name's Hazel. She's been my right-hand woman um, since day one. So I got her on board. She would have very good event experience, background, uh, and very much a skill set that are comp Like, I know my strengths and weaknesses, and I wanted somebody on the team to balance that. So between the two of us, we hit the ground running and started to develop the community programs in our first three property developments. So we set up the company in September 2019 and then we were six months operating when COVID, or when COVID hit. Yeah. So you literally couldn't make it up. You set up a community business to bring people together and then we're being like, oh, stay at home and like, don't meet anybody in real life. I was like, are you actually winding me up? Um, but the only thing that actually, I was like, you can either laugh or cry about it, I guess. I kind of did both for about two weeks, I'd say. Um, but I was like, look, sure, you know, a pandemic was never going to be in the threat of my business plan. So, what can you do? Um, but I guess, yeah, then, but in a very strange way, there's been pros and cons to everything and to the pandemic. I think taking a step back and looking at what my ambition was for my first year of business was probably very optimistic. I hadn't even successfully, successfully developed three new developments yet. And my plan was to be in 10 by next year. Uh, you know, you I learned so much by adapting the business online and how to deliver online community while adding value to, you know, the community members. And then also at the same time, I was able to put my business processes, operations, every systems, all of that in place that weren't in place when I first set up. So now obviously we're moving into like, you know, January of this year, restrictions lifted, our business grew by 100%. We retained all of our clients during the pandemic. We also grew the business as well. We secured Walmart as a client for online stuff. Um, I was going to say Walmart in Ireland. Uh, yeah. Well, Walmart Global Tech were in Ireland. So we got their Dublin business. And then because it was virtual, they could share it, you know. Um, and yeah, coming out of the pandemic, we, you know, gr we've grown the business by 100%. We've also now built up our staff uh, or the team, but that's because of Leo. So along the way, Leo were able to help me with different mentors. They got me the trading online voucher to set up my website. Um, and I got into phase two of New Frontiers as well. So from doing the management um, side, like I knew before I even set up the business that I needed to develop out a community platform because I knew the functionality that was needed to complement the service. So I knew what needed to be built. I just didn't know how we were going to figure that out. And going through the New Frontiers program, they were able to help me kind of, you know, get that solution finally developed. And that now just launched in September of this year. And I'm after doing demos with all of my existing clients. And we also got contacted by CB in Perth and Brisbane. And I'm also speaking with property companies over in Melbourne as well. And so far, 100% of the feedback has been positive. Now, touch wood, I have to do a wider scope, obviously. But at the same time, no, it actually is really good. Like I am the person who was managing the communities. So I know what you need to be successful on the management side for the person who's looking after the community and for the person who's on the user experience on the front end of the platform. So... And I looked at all the competition as well. And because the competition was either too expensive or didn't have all the functionality that we needed is why I was like, well, we need to develop this because it makes sense. And it's, it's what's needed to be the full picture to make everything run really smoothly. Um, so I'm really delighted to say that we now finally have that sorted. And I'm kind of back to where I was originally in my head in 2019. It's just took a lot longer because of it won all the challenges that come with business that you don't know what you don't know yet. And then the pandemic wasn't ideal, even though slowing down wasn't the worst thing in a weird way. You two are just amazing. <laughs> do you know what I could do? 
I could actually probably do a series of podcasts about the two of you. <laughs> like two brilliant stories. And I didn't really know the backstory to either of you. It's just incredible. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Oh, no, I mean, I'm just going to go, on, whoa, what have we here? And I'm just looking at the clock there. I know we're going to run out of time. You better, what I want you to do is what you've already done yourselves. Please encourage young women into business, entrepreneurship. I keep telling people it's the only way to keep your head straight because if you're working for the man or the woman, it's not a great place. Do it for yourself. Yeah. Still drive you nuts anyway, but, you know. So, yeah. sorry, let's start... Um, maybe with you, uh, Jeanette, about the future. Yeah. Like you're in, we said, 800-odd pharmacies in Ireland. What about the overseas? Yeah, so we just signed a deal in Northern Ireland uh, yesterday. So Congratulations. Gonna... All of this stuff is just... <laughs> so that, in, theoretically, is your first export. You know that? Well, we exported to our first pharmacy chain in Scotland last month. Okay. Um, so what we really would love to see is the product in a clinical setting. So this pharmacy chain in the UK, there's prescriber pharmacists and they run clinics where they do chickenpox vaccines, throat swabs for a sore throat over there. And then the pharmacist can decide if you need an antibiotic or not. Or not. And they give regular hard candy pops to the children as a reward or to br as a bribe. And they immediately switch to ours when they saw honey, zinc, vitamin C. The child is engaged and it's fun. And so we would like to see more of the tonsticks in clinical settings. But in the meantime, we're going to just focus on Northern Ireland and then the wider UK from January. And have you got your IP all sorted yes. on that? You own everything? And we do yeah. indeed, yeah. Because that's the one I'm always worried about. You know, yeah. some smart ass comes yeah. along and just nicks it. Well, potentially, you know, you can copy anything yeah. if you just tweak it slightly. But hopefully we have the uh, first market advantage here and we're going to build this as credible and I essential. You talk like a businesswoman. Thank you. I, I she don't, I is a businesswoman. You know, I, I still sometimes don't feel that. I, I'm still this lone parent just juggling. Yeah. Uh, well, it's called I'm imposter, <laughs> imposter syndrome. We, everybody yeah. has it. I feel like a have you got? Have you got other products? Maybe, you know, maybe you don't want to talk about it. Yeah. No, I don't no. want to ruin your business before it takes off. But you have other products coming up. We you? do. Something for the travel market next summer. Good. Another big problem for parents that we're going to try and address. And hopefully it'll be as well received. Good woman. That's what I love. Do you know the way you're even saying encourage people to get into business? It's like, there's a bit, I think there's a business in everybody. Yeah. It's everybody, how many people do you know, or even yourself, you're like, oh, that's a great idea if I could only do X, Y, Z. Like we all have ideas. It's whether we're passionate enough about it or we choose to really focus on it, to take that plunge and go for it. Obviously there's pros and cons of going into business. We're not going to sit here and be like, it's, oh, it's absolutely great. Like when you tell your story and when you get the big wins, it's exciting. But, you know, there's a lot of roller coasters that come along the way. But I think when you actually go for it, working for yourself, like I feel like I've been working for myself for such a long time now. I can't imagine working for somebody else. It's like you have the power to plan your own week, your own day. You do have some control of trying to make your future the way you want it to be. And then even, you know, set your own salaries. You don't have to ask anybody for permission to go on a holiday when you actually get to take one. Um, but yeah, I think anybody has the potential of setting up their own company. Was there, well, sorry to cut across both of you, was there uh, enterprise in either or both of your families? Anybody who like in the background doing things because they say that is a good sign of entrepreneurs? My dad has his own, we have family business. Yeah. So I, I've been answering the phone literally since I could talk, I'd say. Um, You're yeah. very good at talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, he's had his own business. My dad still does have his own business. It's a car um car dealership down in Galway but I mean it's in the middle of nowhere like when we didn't have Google Maps he's going to thump the head off you it's okay because he he's flying it he's got no issues um, but that's what I think also that's what gave me belief as well because if you saw where we live in our Drahan when there wasn't Google Maps I don't know how he sold a car <laughs> how could you find us it's like even when I was young I used to have to give directions I knew the directions off by heart to get to the house because it's you know it's I don't know how people found us but when you can see that you, he set up a car dealership from a, you know beside the house and grew it into like now I think they've got 200 cars and it's a family business and they're they're very successful I'm delighted for them but you know, I kind of saw how 
how to grow that and, and everything that comes with business. Starts with the first car. Honestly, he sold his first car when I was born. So I'm saying I was a lucky star, right? <laughs> because he was just fixing cars and had a garage before that. And then sold one car, then it became two cars and now it's 200. So, And the same question to you, Sinead, about any business in the background or... So, no, is the answer. I'm the polar opposite end of your spectrum. So, so that's great in a way yeah. because it proves anybody can do it. Yeah, what was your right. backstory? So I'm the youngest of six from Northside, Dublin, Finglas. Actually, when I got here today, I said I got lost and from the Northside and someone said, oh, did you not get the memo? You're not allowed in. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so in my family, there's quite a big age gap. My mum had me in her 40s. She thought it was menopause. It was like, no, it's your sixth child. Um, so all my family went to school and when I came up the ranks, I was doing my leave insert and I was like, what are you doing your leave insert? You should be at working now. Um, so I, you know, was blazing trials doing the leave insert in my house, never mind anything else. So the answer is no, but it just doesn't matter. 100%. It doesn't matter. Doesn't it matter doesn't matter, matter your personal situation, your circumstances, your finances. If you have something that you really care about, you just find a way. OK, another question, because as I say, I could spend probably all day talking to you because it's, it's when, you, when you're thinking along the lines of both of you are thinking, you come up with lots of other ideas as well. True. There's a fellow called John Teeling. I don't know whether you've ever heard of him. Teeling's whiskey and Teeling's this, that and the other. He, I had him on the uh, programme probably episode something like, oh, I don't know, it's a long time ago. He never stops thinking about big ideas. Yeah. Do you two think along yeah. ideas? Yeah. yeah, all the time. Oh, okay. yeah, all the, I have so many ideas. <laughs> so <laughs> many. So little time. <laughs> yeah. 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 The so whole new mindset when you, when you run a business, you look at things in, as opportunities, mm -hmm. yeah. which you wouldn't have before. So, Sinead, you have, you're obviously trying to get your ton sticks out to the world. Mm -hmm. The other ideas, and don't tell me what they are, because I don't want to nick them on you, but those ideas, what do you do with them? Just park them into a, I don't know, into a, 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 an envelope somewhere? Yeah. Or? Because you wouldn't have time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that they're, brilliant. Pity? <laughs> they're brilliant. But isn't that a pity is that there are these great ideas. If only there was some way that you could actually open them up and yeah. do something with them. Yeah. Especially in manufacturing. But life is long. You know? Life is long. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I have all these ideas, but I feel like I'm going to get to, I, pl I plan to get to at least two more of them. Um, so. Property related or? No. That's really interesting. No, no, no. No. I have to kind of do a memo, the memory man, or try to read minds here. <laughs> Yeah, but um, I, I love coming up with ideas or anything that gets me excited. I write it down. I write everything down. But I have about five journals around the house, you know, not organised. But anytime I get an idea, I have to write it down, map it out and then I park it. But I think but that was one of the best things about doing the New Frontiers programme at Enterprise Ireland because I went in, even with the, the solution I have now, I had all these other ideas that I could do with this one solution that I still might work on. But it really got me to scale everything back because I was probably talking about three different companies and I had a team of two. You know, it's like, what are you <laughs> trying to do? So the biggest learning I've had from doing that process is, okay, you have to focus and focus on something and get that done and get that 100% and scale everything back. But you can revisit them once you build out your team and if, then validate that market and, and continue. So uh, one thing at a time. <laughs> and like Sinead, uh, you raised your cash. That's a lot of cash to have raised. Yeah. You have raised nothing, have you? No, I'm all self-funded. So as I said, I had clients before I had a business plan. So I obviously was able, and I I put a good structure in place. Um, so I was I was making money straight away. Um, Happy days. Mm -hmm. I know. Well <laughs> and if you have CBRE or do you have CBRE in Australia as a client, an actual no, client? No, we're just chatting to them, but the okay. chat went well. So, you know, <laughs> I'm very optimistic. I know big global ambitions. Um, you also know that means that you have to travel business class down to Australia. I put it in my cash flow. It's all good. <laughs> That's all good. <laughs> when you were on your world tour, did you go down to Australia? Did yeah, you work I in did Australia? three months. No, I didn't work at all. I, I, did, I did great uh, when She's I left. Handy number, isn't handy. she? Handy. I'm <laughs> Nothing's handy. And if I learned dancing from the event today, we actually don't give ourselves enough credit for all the hard work that we do. I did so much work to get into a nice position to be able to travel. And then I enjoyed myself 100%. Absolutely. And Dead right. Yeah, no, I, I did a full world trip. But uh, yeah, I was in Australia for three months. Um, it was absolutely incredible. For second final question, because if there is a final question, is when you speak of working hard, which of you works hardest? Who works hardest? Out of the Both. two of us? Yeah. Both. Obviously both of us yeah. work extremely hard. <laughs> How hard is hard? How many hours? How many days? Oh, jeez. You can't quantify it because, you know, you're up in the morning, you might get up early, send a few emails off before the day starts. In my case, get the gang off. 
so like relaxed. Actually, to be fair, her yeah. life is harder. That's no, a fact. It's just, just uh, different, different challenges. Setup. But yeah. like, I honestly, having kids yeah. and managing everything, yeah. I and a dog. full a dog. respect. Oh, he's so my best. Full respect. I probably trade a child for the dog, but we won't go in. <laughs> no, my, my lot are older. I've My range, age range is 8 to 21. So the three eldest ones take care of themselves now, which is, is handy for me now. But uh, I don't think... You know, it's a it's a competition. Women are all hard working. Yeah, <laughs> they know? do. They yeah. Do. And you know, they do. It's, you can't put time on it because you know, one week it, it just changes all of the time. You know, and until you build out your team and everything, you're, it's it's even great to get a weekend back. You know what I mean? Mm. So, and it, there's a lot of sacrifice that goes with setting up your company. It's like there's so much to do. You even trying to balance life and friendships and family and and growing something and and everything in between. So, but both of you have a smile on your face. Yeah, because oh. it doesn't feel like work. It's yeah. so fulfilling. It's yeah. like you so satisfying. You are singing my song. I <laughs> love this stuff. Come here to me. Final, final question is, hire in a heartbeat. You did get that email, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> Who so wants to answer? It's a no-brainer for us. Okay. Um, Amy Connolly. Yeah. I'll tell you why. She has built some incredible brand. You know, she... she She's been sitting, she sat in the same chair wow. as you. She entered a crowded market space. She's carved out her identity here. Yeah. You know, I've bought her cosmetics just because someone said, oh, Amy Connolly, and it's not even, you know, she's amazing. She's opened a flagship store on Grafton Street and that was after the UK market and she had like X amount of profit, not just revenue, in a very short period of time and it that takes a lot of work. So we are kind of wanting to mirror her journey. Well, we'll give Amy a buzz for you, you because we do know her. <laughs> and But you're not going to take Amy, are you? Sorry, no, 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 no. Who are you going to go for? Um, I'm going to go with Anya Kerr. Um, I actually met her this morning, so it was very inspirational to talk to her. And she is, uh, she's very successful and she's after developing her own technology uh, company and she sold it to Spotify. So we're That's uh, Kinzen. K-I-N-Z-E-N. Yes. Yeah, you're all over it. Mm. Um, it's like he knows business or something. Yeah, <laughs> you seem to know what's going on. But they only uh, sold it last week. It's unreal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For That's an undisclosed amount, so you know it's it's good. But um, She's brilliant, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> I'd listen to her all day. <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose for me, I having somebody with the experience obviously a woman in business she's done incredible for herself and then also to be able to like scale and grow and sell um, in technology is something that I'd love to sit down and have coffee with her and even pick her brain never mind if she joined my team Did you ask her? <laughs> uh, yeah so we'll see how And you goes. are going to do it I presume she will do it for you? Oh yeah yeah yeah. I don't see how Did, anyone could say no to this <laughs> Did you ask Amy yet? No I haven't I've never, I've never got to meet her in person I just she's I'm a big e fan of her Male her. Of course. Like she do LinkedIn, is sure. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. No, I've seen lovely, her on lovely. events. She's very yeah. um, And she used to have the like. place down the road here in Dundrum. That is now shut. I just walked by the other day and it's, she's now, as you say, on Grafton Street. And going for world domination. Exactly. Good for her. Ambition, yeah. ambition, yeah. ambition. That is Sinead Crowther of Tonsticks and Lisa Gagan of Sun of Life. We never even got into Sun of Life because that, of course, means Sun of Happy, Happy Life and all the rest. We didn't but you got even, it in the intro. We kind, kind of. of got it in the <laughs> app as well. We touched on the app, mm -hmm. but didn't really want to go into the technical. It's all good. It's top secret. <laughs> That's what it is. Okay. <laughs> Ladies, what a pleasure. Shinnit and Lisa, thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. And that is it from The Great Business Show, episode 109. You've probably already forgotten my earlier ask to press the share button on LinkedIn. Both of you have to press share. Don't just like. That means nothing. <laughs> Do it now, please. Or get the link and zap it to your pals on WhatsApp. Just think of all those women you know who need this episode's encouragement to set up their own business. You've just heard them. They love you for helping them. And a hello, advertising managers. Why are you not advertising with us? Big Red Cloud does, Microfinance Ireland, Virgin Media, and Uderos de Goethe to have our engagement levels are through the roof. Our audience of 74,000 just love that great business show. And we record here at the Dublin South Podcast Studios, where new sound engineer Lee Brennan is now an old hand. Later, Neil Oliver and post-production sound will add that extra sparkle that makes us sound like hmm, heaven on earth. And if you would like to record a podcast, contact the Dublin South Podcast Studios. It's where the fifth court, that's the new podcast we have, sits as well. And if you would like the media group to produce a podcast for you or your business or one on your own favourite topic, then do talk to me, Connell O'More, and find me on LinkedIn. 
And as always, our great business insight and tips are brought to you thanks to our sponsor, De Facto Shaving Oil, the world's best all-natural shaving oil. They back us. Please back them. DeFactoShave.com will get them. And the two ladies will be delighted to know that you're getting shaving oil from Tom Murphy as a special <laughs> gift. Do Thank not, you. <laughs> and do not forget to buy Business Plus magazine, where we now have a regular column all about the podcast. From me, Connell O'Moran, Mila Buechus for listening. I'm the Slan Tunnel.